Frank. Frank, mind it, man. Can I Be Frank is all about capturing real, authentic, unedited conversation. dancing. So I'm just, you don't have to give, you don't have to introduce yourself nowadays. Yeah. That's the way it is. Like in Ireland, anyway, you definitely don't have to introduce yourself. I don't yourself. do it. No, yeah. no. You don't no. have to say, this is what no. I do, because they'll know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, maybe I should introduce myself, don't mind. Yeah, but you don't get that feeling of, oh, I hate that question, no. 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 Okay. No, no. okay. Yeah. Um, so what are you doing with your life that now? That is going to now, be your first question. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> so what are you doing with your life now that you've explored the world of dancing? I think, um, so for me it was a bit of a crazy time because last year has been a bit of a roller coaster for me. Mm -hmm. um, I took a decision to talk about something that was quite painful um, and that was cathartic in one way and I took some decisions I probably should have taken quite a while ago. My husband died five years mm -hmm. ago and if I'm being honest, I, the decisions I took in the last six months I should have taken maybe three or four years ago. But nonetheless, it was a bit of an impetus last year to say declutter your life. and. Um, I was an absentee landlady in my own business mm -hmm. um, for some time. I do have investments in other businesses, but publishing in particular, you need to be full of life and you need to be constantly driving it. That's not the kind of business that you can just drop in and out of. And I mm -hmm. wasn't a good boss. Um, and the staff who've worked with me for such a long time deserved a good boss. So mm -hmm. I set about finding a new owner. I think I found a great owner. It was mm -hmm. an American company and they're digitalizing everything. The staff were high-fiving. I tried not to get upset about that <laughs> <laughs> the day I announced it. Um, and it wasn't a big, like, people said, were you at celebration? I didn't. I actually went home and I have a beautiful portrait of Richard, which now sits in the hall. It used to be in my kitchen because mm -hmm. I used to have coffee with him every morning, which was part of a grieving process. But my mother said, put it in the hall. And when you feel you need to see him, you can consciously go and visit it. Mm. So I sat on the floor in the hall with a cup of tea, having a chat with him saying, I finally did what I should have done actually a few years ago. And it felt like a moment in time because when he was alive, of course, you've got your own future together, always mapped out over, I don't know, New Year's Eve, a bottle of wine in the evenings. You imagine mm. after all your years of building up a company that you might do other things. And, and when he was gone, it was as much the fact that I'd lost somebody who was so important to me and who I loved very much, but also that future was gone. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I didn't address it quickly enough. I just kept imagining that if I just continued working incredibly hard, which I did. The pain will go away. And also the future would change for me. But mm -hmm. you know, the thing about our brains is unless you consciously make a plan, you actually mm -hmm. just end up treading water and worse sometimes your head is going backwards, you know. I see that in my life with people, particularly of my age, maybe even younger, um, where, you know, my son is 19, he's constantly saying, this is what I wanna be when I grow up, and really, you know, crazy to get on with life, and they're full of activity, and their brains are sparking all over the place, and they're debating, and they're dialoguing, and, and then you get into your 30s, and maybe life just takes over, and babies come, mm -hmm. and life becomes a little bit more rote, and everything you thought you were gonna be, um, for women in particular, it's often replaced with your hopes and dreams for your children. So mm. if I say, how are you doing? They'll tell me how Johnny's just got a place at university. You mm. know? And instead of driving themselves forward, um, they start thinking about maybe things that they loved in the past, listening to music that used to make them want to get up and dance or dressing in a way that they always liked or wearing a particular hairstyle mm. or going back to the same restaurant. So why would you try anything new? We like that one. Let's go on holiday to the same place. You know. Yeah. So, so your brain hates that stuff. It hates the fact that you're, you know, always doing the same things. And I understand why people, as they're approaching their 40s, don't want to look forward because none of us want to say, hey, I want to be frail and vulnerable like my parents and grandparents. It's not an aspiration mm -hmm. any of us have. But I think for me, um, once you stop looking forwards, you're actually, you're almost facing an inevitable decline mm -hmm. because 
life expectancy in Ireland is 82. Um, it's actually higher than most places in the world if you take places like Sierra Leone. Um, the fact is that the ba baby boomers who are retiring now, they've been in denial about their age all their lives. They've no intentions of retiring. Yeah. So for most of us, we have an awful lot of life to live. Mm. And yet our vulnerable, frail um, life expectancy in Ireland is sadly only 75. So if we don't start in our late 30s, early 40s thinking about what am I doing for the third chapter of my life, we actually almost self-fulfilling prophecy go into decline once we head towards retirement. So for me, the lack of a future was for a different reason. I didn't want to imagine a future without Richard. So my head was constantly going backwards to the great times we used to have. And, um, and then this last year was the first time I owned it. I just said, no, I'm not, I don't want this to happen. I'm not treading water anymore. I was doing, you know, 50 jobs at once. The comedians kept saying there's loads of jobs in Ireland. It's just Nora Casey has them all, you know. <laughs> I was at one point getting up at like 4.30 a.m. doing news talk, um, coming off air at 10 o'clock. I was doing RTE Cork in the afternoon on a Friday. I did 13 episodes of something called The Takeover. Still wrote my book in my spare time. Yeah. So it was no life. That's exhausting. It was exhausting. And, 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 and yet, during it, it probably saved me. Yeah. Because for all of the lack of personal life in terms of you know when you love somebody and live with somebody they give you all that lovely fix of you know the hugs and making you feel good about yourself and somebody who you can tell at the end of the day what's happened to you my work life actually fulfilled that for a while i watched your ted talk once and then i watched it again <laughs> again last night and uh i think if you know uh, i had this chat with somebody else actually but if you know loss <laughs> if you know loss and have mm. felt loss when you hear somebody else talking about loss, I kind of go, because I, I, well, I was getting emotional only because of, it's not like I know you, you know, know, any, know anything about you apart from the superficial things that I would see. But when somebody starts talking about loss, you kind of instantly go to the idea of loss, the sense of that feeling, yeah. that gap. Yeah, that's what, that's what happens because there's nothing quite like it. But anyway, in your talk, what I got from the whole idea was motion. Mm. and movement and exactly. um, in a way life dragged you along but you you allowed yourself to be dragged on yeah really that's what I got I the think impression I, of. I, um, in that TED talk um, I've just done another one which is coming up soon mm. um, in that one in particular I delved into the science as in why do I feel like this I've, I've never been a great believer in the the stages of grief it's mm. from something that was written quite a long time ago about something totally different. It was it was written actually um, in the context of somebody facing the inevitability of their own life ending. Yeah. And um, and I wasn't going through those phases myself and felt guilty that I wasn't. So when I started to look into the science behind it, I began to understand a little bit more about why I felt so bad, why I just wanted to sit on the couch and you know eat everything I could, and I had no energy and I was listless. And you know the whole issue around you know the neurotransmitters in your brain. Not to get too geeky, but there is totally a science, as much as you feel your heart is broken, it's actually your brain that's a bit broken yeah. when you're grief stricken. And um, Is it a piece of you that, say you are you, which is all of the things that you are, your husband, your son, your work, all of that, and then a part of that is taken, which is, mm. you know, you're you and your husband, and we won't get, we're not going, I don't want no, to go there, but no. I think the... I think that's gone. Yeah. Like it is, that is just gone. And there's no explanation for that vacancy there. And there's no exactly. rational way to be able to say, right, I need, uh, this is, uh, you know, if you're hungry, you can eat. If you're thirsty, you can drink. But if you've experienced loss, it's very, know. and also, um, you have to not to go into all the neurotransmitters, but the one that's tremendously important, which I've become a bit of a science of, is dopamine. Mm. So if you take the blood of um, National Geographic did a great survey a couple of years ago where they took the blood of of those great explorers that climbed to the top of mountains or tread into jungles when the rest of us would be running in the opposite direction, and they discovered they had higher levels of dopamine than the rest of the population. Yeah. It's it's not a very helpful um, thing to have cursing through your veins because on the one hand it helps to drive you forward. On the other hand, it encourages you to take risks. So, so people who have addictive issues also have high levels of dopamine. Mm. The reason when you give up smoking, which gives you a dopamine fix, that you take up chocolate is it's the same pathway. Yeah. So you're replacing one for another and, and actually that level of dopamine fix is not good for you. Mm. The, the good part of it though is um, it's what gets you up in the morning, makes you 
want to do things. When they do studies with rats, they'll have ones with normal levels of dopamine and ones with slightly higher levels, and there's a fence. And if you jump the fence, you get a bigger piece of cheese, or you can go down the nice slow route and yeah. get a smaller piece. And of course, the ones with the lower levels of dopamine say, well, sure, I'm grand. I'll just have the small piece of cheese. Yeah. And the ones with the higher levels say, yeah, I'm jumping the fence with the higher piece. But in my own life, I see people all the time. I can, I, I, at one point, and I st probably can still do it, I can walk into a room and I can tell whether somebody has low levels or, or, or high levels by mm. just talking to them. So I have friends who say, kind of a mad person are you you know I mean I do a part-time job and I'm grand with it and if I didn't have that I'd be you know they just see life as something that is just you know a nice you know passage through time whereas I attack life and I feel <laughs> that the time is going to run out if I don't keep running after it yeah and if at any point I feel well, like it is going to run out I mean, that is going to run that's out, but, but but there are some people who like look at me and think I'm half crazy with all the things I do why are you doing all of that so, you know, this year, if I feel at any time I'm not terrifying myself sufficiently, I go out of my way to terrify myself. So yeah. last year I, I'm terrified of heights, but I learned how to fly a plane and I did whitewater rafting and, you know, I'm killed kind of throwing myself off cliffs and I, I broke my kneecap climbing Karen Tool. This is the expression, life begins outside your comfort zone. Yeah. I totally, I totally believe that. And this year we did, um, I went off to, I go to Africa every year for a month, but I, Generally, you know, I grew up in, next to Dublin Zoo. I love animals. I spend a lot of my life doing conservation work. And so Africa for me is my spiritual home. Um, mm. But I really wanted to do it, do it this year. So we went to Ethiopia for a while. Then we went trekking um, on the Zambezi and stayed in two man tents with elephants. And we trekked rhino and we, um, we went up to Victoria Falls. And I, you know, I did things, although I've been in Africa all my life, I'd never really done things that were very very real i mean at one point you know cecil the lion who was killed by the poacher um i literally slept in a tent with his entire pride outside the other side of the tent i mean i didn't sleep a wink but it was one of the most exhilarating things i've done you know but when you're putting yourself out there and feeling that fear do you need to go back then to a quiet place do you are you or does it if you don't have that adrenaline, do you miss it or do you need to sometimes go back and see? So and I just say adrenaline holds you back. So adrenaline mm. is, gives you flight or fight. And so it's not adrenaline that makes you climb the mountain or no, to do it. Yeah. It's, it's dopamine. Yeah. And I think because I had such, you know, obviously when you love somebody and you live with somebody, you get huge amounts of dopamine from somebody who, even no matter how dreadful you look, saying you look great, you know, or giving you the hug or when you have a bad day making you feel better about yourself. So mm. that's all about a dopamine fix. So as much as I could talk endlessly about the process of grief, the reason why it's so hard when you love somebody so much and they're gone from your life is that dopamine goes down to zero virtually. Mm. And and your your whole inertia, your whole drive, your whole reason for getting up in the morning is suddenly gone. Um, and I think that's partly why we spend less time with our parents as we grow older, because when they die, even though it's catastrophically painful, and it was when my father died, it was nothing compared to Richard's death. Mm. Because Richard was with me from the moment I woke up in the morning until mm. the moment I went to sleep. So we were intertwined in one another's lives. Whereas your parents over time, you see them for holidays and weekends and in the evening time. So it's like mother nature's preparing you inevitably for the fact that there's a slight separation happening. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, that was, I didn't have that drive anymore that, essential need to want to continue uh, with my life because... And yet you did though. And yet I did. And the reason I did, you know, there's about 10% of people get something called complicated grief. We all know them. Um, people who 10 years beyond losing a spouse will still be talking about it like as though it was yesterday mm. and who cannot move on. It's a recognised mental health issue now, complicated grief. And, and I think that one of the primary motivators for me is I had a young son who was 13 and I didn't have the luxury of crawling under a bed and saying, mm. you know, I'm just going to stay under here until life looks a little bit better for myself. So I've always kind of said, not facetiously, but when people are recently bereaved, we're better off taking them up and throwing them out of a plane and then letting them know halfway down there's a parachute button. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, well, I mean, there is something in that. Because know? the drive, you know, unfortunately, you know, I have friends who will say, would you ever come and talk to my mom? She lost my dad, you know, seven years ago. She won't go anywhere. She's no interest. She doesn't want to even go get her hair done. She won't go on holiday. So 
you know, the loss of interest in life is very much to do with the fact that you were intertwined with another person's life. Mm. Um, just taking us full circle back to the last year, um, I'm not too sure what the number of years it is for a grieving process. I will always miss Richard and he'll always be something that's a gap in my life rather than, mm. um, you know, I have good friends who always talk about, oh, and I felt Richard around and, you know, people do that sometimes and they think they've been helpful. And mm. I have just this huge chasm in front of me, which was where Richard was. There's no presence there. So, yeah. um, but I do think that after the five year mark, I definitely felt ready to take those decisions. Now it was not as raw as the first year when I was charging his iPhone every day and the side of the bed was exactly the way it was mm. before he died and I wouldn't tackle issues around his clothes. And um, It wasn't like that, it was more the fact that I probably was filling in those five years, by the way, with amazing things, like things I've always wanted to do, but they were replacing perhaps that level of, I think you've called it quietness, but. I didn't have that stillness in myself mm. that that I do now. I was constantly, if I saw a gap in the diary, there would have to be something in it. You okay, know? not to be alone. Which and it wasn't even alone. It was more that if I was very busy, I didn't have time to think. You know, and um, and perhaps the worst thing I did after Richard died is that I did take time out, and myself and Dara went down to Wicklow to live for a while. And it was just, I just remember it has been this incessant rain that just went on and on and on. And we had nothing to talk about. Neither of us, you know, were that comfortable sitting in the forest. <laughs> we were, somebody, you know, was always describing the many different ways we have of describing rain. And I think I lived through it during that time because we all we talked about was the rain and the kind of the rain and the sound of it on the leaves. And, you know, it just was probably a little bit too soon for us to be thinking about things like that. And uh, whereas now I do feel quite still and mm. um, I do feel comfortable with myself and um, and so therefore I was able to take that decision to say goodbye to the company which meant a lot to me my babies I think once you buy your first company it becomes really important to you mm. and and secondly to um, I'm selling the building that Harmony is in I'm selling my house in London which was Richard and my first home and okay, I could well. never sell it it's on the market right now um, and the dancing was part of that kind of moving on piece for me because I had... Um, That's a radical move on. Yeah, and yeah. I knew I needed a, a, a break, uh, a breaker in between because I didn't want to be sitting around over the initial period, you know, second guessing myself and wondering if it was the right thing to do and mm. um, feeling a bit maudlin about anything. I wanted it to be positive and to stay positive. so. I said initially from the beginning, guys, I'm taking a couple of months out to do this crazy thing. Um, there was absolutely no downside to it because my head was full. I do salsa classes now on Tuesday and Wednesday, so we had two okay. hour classes. As a result night. of doing? Yeah. Wow. I do it with my pro dancer, and we had 70 people. Like, you know, I have all these friends of mine who come after work, literally, as they stand after work, and we do the cha cha and salsa and the rumba. <laughs> and for two hours on, you know, a miserable Tuesday night, people forget everything because when you're trying to learn dance steps, you can't, you know, there's no headspace for anything else, yeah. you know. So, I hadn't realized before I'd done it what a great de-stressor it is and how much you laugh and how many hugs you get and how great it is to feel fit. So I was constantly going to spinning classes and looking at my watch every 10 mm. seconds. Is it over yet? Is it over yet? I got up in the treadmill yeah, in so the morning dull, yeah. and I listened to Morning Ireland. But honestly, it's just the worst, most boring thing I do. Um, so I was amazed when I was dancing that I was filling in these eight, eight hour days for those two months. and. Literally, the first four hours be gone just like that. I wouldn't even notice that we're gone. And how did you find the idea? So you, you being a complete and utter novice, and mm. not being, not being the boss, not being in control, or yeah. not not being able to fix when you you do, you just have to keep doing it. So yeah. you, you said something in an interview which I really liked was, oh, I didn't have to win at this, so I just. Enjoyed yeah, it. Exactly. Is that, is that exactly. it? Like, yeah, you were, it seems a bit free doing it, free from all the shackles of the grind, we'll say. And that I think that's the most interesting thing for me is that, um, you know, if you're in business or you're negotiating or, you know, I'd be a naturally competitive person yeah. in my own zone, intellectually, you know, yeah. I'd be naturally competitive. I get that, I haven't met 35 minutes, I just know. I, I am, <laughs> well, instinctively. Well, obviously, I've seen you. Um, 
but dragons and things like that. Yeah, and that's really like Dragon's Den is definitely not me, um, but they yeah. they create a persona around you. I think uh, the guys who film that would say who are the same crew who do dancing. You know, I was constantly trying to help the participants. They would say, "Stop doing that, Nora. Stop smiling at them. Stop trying to help them." Really? Yeah. So, so it is still. I wondered about yeah, I, I, and we're jumping, but I wonder if, uh, uh, what made you stop doing it or that you moved on from it, because it really is that personality type of. It's, well, let's say it's rigid. Yeah. rigid in, in mind in, in ways and it's da, 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 to on the dance floor and I'm not like that I think I, what most people know about me is um, you know firstly I have a really good sense of humor and mm. I don't you know generally my place is a fun place to work and the reason why people come back to I think 60% of people who work at Harmonia are back second third time round, so they go off to other places and we have a good crack and you know okay. it's, it's a very relaxed atmosphere and um, and I think um, Dragon's Den is a format which works well if you've got so, you know, five surly looking people with their arms folded, barking yeah. I'm out and, and yeah, not okay. being very nice to the people who walk in, you know, just yeah. glaring at them and making them feel as uncomfortable <laughs> as possible. So um, I, it, mm. it wasn't for that reason I left it because I really enjoyed doing it. And okay. uh, it was in filming terms great because we filmed it over a two week period in the new year. Yeah. So we just did 12 hour days and just, you know, went through them. OK, it was great. Um, it was more that by at that point uh, when Richard passed, I had 11 investments, um, one or two on my own. And some of them were through Dragon's Den. And, you know, people generally they're not just looking for your money. They're looking for a lot of your energy. Mm. And I didn't have enough energy for my own business or myself, let alone all of them. So okay. I was very conscious in the aftermath that the last thing I wanted to do was to help somebody else feel motivated and I, I didn't have that energy to mm. give them and I felt it would be immoral to keep investing um, and in fact over the five years I've gradually you know given people back their shares and, and I've ended up with two or three that I have okay. still uh, which I have a, a bit of a passion for so um, but to go back to dancing the the really interesting thing for me is um, because I wasn't it, like in no way was I they're believing that I could win it or even go very far. I just yeah. I just saw it as something that I was going to really enjoy every moment of it. And yeah. and once you take that winning off the table, mm. every time you walk through the door, you're going to feel good yeah. because you're there. It's carefree then. Yeah, you've got every single moment. You're just enjoying every second of it. You're not really like to my cost. I didn't know anything about the voting. I hadn't yeah. a clue. I was telling my mother you can only vote once and apparently you can vote constantly for the whole period. <laughs> I was <laughs> totally switched off from the voting thing. And then afterwards I was thinking, maybe I should have paid a bit more attention to that. And then no, because if I had, I wouldn't have enjoyed yeah. every second of doing the dancing. And I, you know, I remember somebody saying, did you have a couple of more dances? And, and the fact is Curtis and I had done the quick step and the jive and I said I do but I don't think I need to do it on national television that was the, <laughs> the interesting point for me was you know I actually do a lot on TV and yeah. you know of course I'm back doing current affairs and Brexit I, I just kept saying to myself how's that a week ago I was getting spray tanned and sparkled up and now I'm sitting there discussing Brexit <laughs> with politicians shouting at me um, but I think the nice thing for me was I was living in this wonderful cocoon of you know, and when I say dancing, we had Monday off and my brother, who's CEO of the business that has just been sold, he couldn't get me to, I couldn't concentrate on a single thing. Like I didn't have mm. the headspace to do anything other than to tell him about my difficulties with my steps. And we have a, <laughs> and we have a WhatsApp group with the people, you know, all of us who went in together. And yeah. it's interesting now I'm out of dance prison. I'm looking back at their comments and it's all about, I can't sleep last night. And I'm worried. So I, even the ones that were quite lighthearted gone in have gone to the dark side of okay. you know, the obsessiveness about the, yeah. the winning as opposed to enjoying the dancing, you know? But it was a privilege. Look, and now I know how to do the foxtrot. Yeah. Um, I know how to do a lot of Latin, which is I like. I remember about three weeks into it, saying to my friend, "I think I'm, you know, I think I like Latin more than ballroom." And she just fell about the place. I was just listen to you, <laughs> you know, three weeks ago, you didn't even know the difference. <laughs> and did you ever? Did you ever? Uh, did you ever do any dancing? No, None. I did uh, for for breast cancer once. They asked us to do um, a strictly thing in the convention center, and I have Indian blood, as in my great grandmother. And so I said I would do Bollywood with a friend of mine who's from Pakistan. Wow. And um, 
And what I realized within, you know, a day or two of watching every Bollywood movie is that you need about 300 cast members to do Bollywood well. <laughs> and, yeah. and secondly, it was like synchronized walking because it wasn't, you know, Bollywood isn't really about, you know, high caliber dance, but mm. there's a lot of movement that you use to describe the words that you're saying to the other person. So oh, yeah. if you're in a 500 seat seater you know dinner nobody's going to notice those words it just looks like weird movements you yeah know? yeah so um yeah it was it was kind of um not not my finest performance it, it, i'm going to give this quick like it, it changes your brain i think doing those sorts of things do you yeah. know what i mean that um you are <laughs> different who who you were beforehand is different than the person afterwards because i I don't, I'm sure the science must be like s s new synapses have been created, new yeah. movements in the brain. And so therefore you, whoever you are, has changed as a result mm. of doing something exactly. so new. And the other thing I, you know, not having ever known anything about dancing, I mm. was actually on crutches when the producer called me. Right. I, I broke my kneecap climbing um, Karen Tool, coming down Karen Tool. Um, and yeah, and I'd been waiting to get my kneecap replaced. So in mm. September, when I saw a clear vista in front of me, I said, let's do it then. And um, the surgeon had said, you know, obviously you're going to have a big brace and two crutches. And you go onto one crutch and you can drive the car after a period, of, you know, the usual. So mm. six months before you're fully recovered. And then in late October, still on the crutch, I got the call to say, would you like to do this dancing thing? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'm still on the crutch. Let me check. So but my surgeon was really kind of up for it and said, you know what, I had progressed really fast, as in I ditched the first crutch really quickly, yeah. I'd driven the car quickly, and he said, I think you can do it, but you'll have to do very intensive physio, and um, I'll support you. Um, your kneecap is now titanium, and you can't break it, but mm -hmm. actually your muscles and everything are all going to take a bit of a beating. So it was kind of a Herculean effort for me to go from ditching the crutch to being able to actually put pressure on that knee, and I was, in the first few weeks back and forth to the hospital constantly getting it drained and getting injections and um, extra braces but it was so worth it because I was also beginning to understand something really important about dancing which I then of course had to research and study which is that um, it's possibly the best form of exercise you can do as you age so yeah. all of the research shows if you do repetitive things like cycling or running or walking or doing the gym work it just exercises those particular bits of your body. Um, I was saying to myself, you want to start a business in this. That's what I said to myself. And I have, but it's for it's for the two pro dancers. So, so what I realised <laughs> is, um, yeah, you, you can take the dancer out of me, but you can never <laughs> yeah. take the business yeah. out of me. Yeah. So my head, what I what I was incredibly into. You want to share it to everybody. Everybody's going to yeah, love this. Everybody has to love it. Yeah. I'm telling you, the whole world is into it now. Yeah. So, so my brain was so full of like within a five minutes of starting a dance lesson, I was no longer thinking about the million things that were bothering me. Mm. And my head was full of trying to learn these backward steps, forward steps. And also, um, Curtis, my pro dancer, is dancing royalty. His brother AJ is in Strictly, his father's a champion right. dancer. He's a great kid. He's only 21, two years older than my son, like, you know, mm. um, and bossing me around like Billy. Yeah. Do it again, Nora, it's not good enough. Do it again, do it again. <laughs> so, um, what I realized is that he didn't inherit a sports, like, you know, dancing with the stars. Quite a lot of them have sporting backgrounds and fitness backgrounds and, <clears throat> you know, they're young and they're supple and um, he didn't get somebody like that. He got somebody who was over 50, who'd been crouched over a computer all her life, who mm. was on a crutch, who had just had a kneecap replaced. I mean, talk about taking every possible, you know, handicap if it was golf and throwing it onto one person. Yeah. And yet within four weeks of him doing stretches and toning and and leg work and I couldn't touch my toes. I couldn't put my heel to my bum. I yeah. he said, Give me your long neck for fox I said, What's a long neck? I mean I had rounded shoulders. Whereas now I can't actually round my shoulders. They're so far back. And you know, when they measured me I was full inch taller on my skeleton. Um, so right. not only did I lose weight, but also my muscle tone is phenomenally changed. Right. So what I realized, and that's within one month. So mm. I was two months dancing at that level, which is quite high level, I agree. But, but to have dramatically changed my body in mm. that time, without me feeling like, now 
I'm obviously forgetting that in the whole of December, I crawled through my door every night. I had a big tub of Epsom pain. salts <laughs> next to the bath. What is it about pain that we don't <laughs> remember? Physical pain, we don't really I, remember. I remember trying to explain to my mother, I've never experienced aches like it. Like every part of my body, because obviously my shoulders, my neck, my arms, my skeleton, we were trying to, he was trying to teach me the splits of all things. Yeah. So every part of me just was like on fire with pain. And I would sink into an hour and a half of Epsom salts, slept like a baby, got up full of energy the next day to go straight wow. back into it again. Yeah, it was great. Like I, I, everyone keeps saying, and would you know them? I can't think of a single negative thing. And then as you say, being hardwired to have a business yeah. brain, Here's this young 21 year old boy who has incredible talents on choreography and teaching. Zero business knowledge. Um, in fact, left school at 16. Mm. And um, all of those dancers are really gone by the time they're 30. And his girlfriend is dancers at the moment with Rob, Emily. And they had started a, a little web thing called Dancer Body, which of course was also aimed at young, fabulous looking 21 year olds who wanted to dance. And I said, there's no money in that. There's money in Alwyn's like me <laughs> <laughs> who will pay you to do stuff, to, to, to create the kind of changes you've done to my body. the holy almost exercise that you can enjoy. Yeah. Like it is. It, and it's so, uh, so because I was talking about it so much, a lot of my corporate friends were saying, I'd love to do that, but I wouldn't have the nerve to do it. Like, and mm. I know that before this, the idea of going on to something called dancer body, like, I mean, it would be so alien to my head, yeah. I wouldn't even think about it. And I would never even turn up in a dance class because I think I would be so terrible. Yeah. So I said, look, let's try it. And I just put it out there on LinkedIn and said, listen, guys, come along. I asked the guy who owns How Salad, could I borrow it for a while for free to help Curtis and Emily get set up? Yeah. 70 people turned up and when I say they turned up there were men in suits and ties like when I did say turn up as you like but <laughs> they literally walked straight from work into it wow. and an, an hour and a half later there you go they were laughing high-fiving they you know because we saw them four routines and they were doing a bit of salsa and a bit of cha-cha and I know like they all turned up again you know so I know that they loved it that's the seeds of a business it's amazing of course it? and, yeah, and yeah. now we've called it confidence <laughs> and uh, right, we've set up um, so all the social media is on confidence they have I have somebody who's willing to do a nixer for them on their website um, we're also doing corporate team building with some mm. of the multinationals so just doing a salsa after work class so as one or two of them said to me Nearly 90 percent. That's of the entrepreneur staff. now. Can I just say all of that? Like you just can't, you can't make <laughs> that be the case because you just can't help yourself. Really. I know. Poor you know. Curtis. Like he, I was saying to his father the night we were booted out, I said he's been the teacher for a couple of months. I'm the teacher now. So um, poor Curtis. I have him off doing business meetings, and his head is like he's excited about everything. And yeah. he's, you know, he said my mom keeps saying I'm changing every day, and I, I just oh. feel. Like anyone can start a business. The, mm. the, the corporate team building thing is really interesting for me because all my life as a woman in business, we used to get taken off on team building things, which frankly, sorry for putting it this way, were macho and male. Mm. And if it wasn't tug of war, it was, you know, it was all outdoors. Yeah. I've never been a Horrendous. sporty outdoor mm. person. So I hated every minute of it. You jump Whereas, off this high thing. Oh, yeah, awful, yeah, yeah. scrambling up walls. And you, like, you know, the guys are all enjoying it. And you're like, oh, I hate it. I hate it. Fish out of water. So. So one of the women who runs one of the multinationals here said to me that she's 90% staff who are not uh, Irish. Mm -hmm. And she said it's very hard for them. They come in here, all different nationalities. To do team building with them is incredibly difficult because English wasn't a first language, they were culturally. Whereas dance is every language. Yeah. And, you know, for 30 minutes to, to do something where you're laughing and, you know, we, last night we were doing a couples thing. We were putting people together that never met each other before. By the time they were leaving, they were all chatting with each other. So, you know, but you it's obviously something. had a natural, some sort of a natural, because I know if I was doing it, all that would be going on in my head is, am I doing this right? Am I doing And I'd, I, I know they'd be saying, just relax. I know I'd get that. Just relax into it. And I'd be putting huge effort into trying to relax. Do you know what I mean? To, to, I and to relax well, as opposed to just and that's, relaxing. I would say that all the pro dancers said it to me from the beginning about the male dancers that are in the uh, competition but also in all the classes is that men tend to overthink it. Yeah, okay. So there was, I was dancing musical. with a guy last night um, who's a cameraman actually on the show who was always yeah. dying to dance. Yeah. And he'd been filming us dancing and when he heard we were doing dance classes, he came along. 
and mm-hmm. he, he really struggled. And I said, stop thinking. Just let your body move. Stop thinking about where your feet should yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's it, because I'd be constantly going, what, what, what do you mean to stop thinking? What, what are you talking about here? I'm not going to be able to... Yeah. yeah. It's okay. great. That, like, I have to say, I, the difference in Curtis and Emily, we now talk virtually every day. Mm. Um, you know, I still got sucked into the vortex of work life again very quickly, and I have a lovely work life, so there's no hardship in that. Um, but I still set aside time every week. We're doing ballroom tonight. Um, just to make sure that they are, I don't know, you have to, I, for me, I feel I have to give back. Mm. Like that young man, I know it was a show, but he also gave me a tremendous gift for two months. I mean, I came yeah. towards the end of January while everyone else was, you know, miserable, sick, uh, overweight, yeah. hadn't done any of their New Year's resolutions, mm. felt terrible about life. And I was sitting there full of energy, full of life, my head completely clear for the first time sleeping properly, a stone and a half lighter, my skeleton totally. Yeah. I would have given that boy back anything, you know? Yeah, that is a gift, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you said there a few minutes ago, which really anybody can set up a business, but is that true, do you think? Mm. Uh, do you see that kind of... Because I, I said to myself, because I saw the interview with you and I saw your passion, it's just impossible for that mindset, the mindset not to go, there's an opportunity here. For some, there just has to be because I've got this. I know that people can get it from. But is there a business in it, or is there a way this can be taken from that? And that mentality is, you could say, oh, I think that's the creative mindset that just can't help itself coming out or expressing itself. Um, it's different to... forms. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I developed a format after Dragon's Den, which I'm doing in London, okay. with a great guy actually who developed the format for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, an Irish guy, mm-hmm. Coleman Hutchinson. So. So when I'd finished Dragon's Den, I, what I knew all along was, it's never the idea, it's the person. Mm. All of us know that, by the yeah. way. And the Y Combinator funds in the US, which is one of the biggest investment vehicles, now interviews young people. And if you have those seven traits of entrepreneurship, they'll back you, okay. they'll work with you to develop an idea. Okay, but if you don't, bye-bye, mm. you don't get the money. And I think I've had more fun, you know, I would have had more fun um, pouring money down a toilet and flushing the chain than working with some of the people I've ended up working with mm. who had great ideas but were just impossible to work with. Yeah. Just wouldn't focus on the plan, wouldn't listen. And I'd say that if you ask anybody in my space, what's your one number one pain in investments? It's people who don't want to listen, mm. who feel that their way is the right way. Mm. And even though at this stage, I've probably helped develop over a thousand businesses, I have an instinct and an antenna for what works and what doesn't. Mm. They're starting out, but they still feel their way is the right way. Yeah. And if they don't want to take advice and mentorship, then there's no, like, um, I have eons of people all day, every day saying, will you have a coffee? I want to talk to you, I'd love your advice. But actually what you find is you sit in front of them and they talk at you for two hours, and then mm. they say it was great talking to you. So I, yeah. I, I increasingly think that- um, And what do you do about that? In your, do I you don't have the patience that. for it? Or do you it's, 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 I used to do business clinics free of charge three or four times a month, I'd start very early in the morning and initially everyone would get 30 minutes and if if they really had something that I wanted to help them with, I'd give them a longer time in the next clinic. Um, As time went on, frankly, as a single mom, trying to hold down multiple different um, thoughts and businesses and, you know, there's so many things I still have on my to-do list. Um, When somebody says, have a coffee, it's only 20 minutes, it's Mm. always two hours and I always walk away with stuff to do. Mm. So I found myself always doing somebody else's stuff yeah. and I am a conscientious person. Um, so you can't help yourself doing it then, is it? I'm doing it and then I have charities that I try to help and so you just run ragged. There's no time, like my, I remember not seeing my mum for three or four weeks because yeah. I was so caught up with everybody else's stuff and, and frankly at times they're not always understanding of the fact that time is so precious. To me it's precious, you know. And you were given the three? Yeah. I've never, yeah, people, you know, once... I, my sense is people do not value free. No. Maybe some do, and they will they'll remember you. Uh, they'll remember the fact that you did this for a long time. But other people will yeah. take the, uh, listen to you, and they'll go off and do their own thing. I'll tell you one thing. They, they and When it's not being paid for. Yeah, but they unfortunately, uh, people are often very critical if you don't spend the time. Hmm. So I will often get people who will abuse me. Uh, online because I haven't done something that they've asked me to do and wow. um, to my head and yeah, that sort but of thing. if you you know the I, I dread New Year for instance because in the run-up to New Year about a thousand connection requests will come through and right. I know that as soon as I connect they'll just my 
in mail will just be full of people who I have a career swerve I want to have a chat with you I'm very similar to you I did this will you just pick up the phone and call me and then I would have to employ somebody full-time to deal with all of that mm. so it might take you know I have a really good person who works with me and she'll often say look everything's really busy we'll come back to you but if you if you're not back within a week another one will come in and oh you know I noticed I wrote you a long letter you didn't even bother to reply or you haven't bothered to meet with me so people are a bit intolerant when you in never think about it. like you obviously replied to me and yeah. Um, yes, yeah well I think your request was so I don't think in my life I've ever asked somebody to do something as a one-way street mm. so um, that's what's interesting is that I am the recipient because of the Dragon's Den profile in particular maybe because of um, the two other business programs I did um, is that it does tend to be a one-way street it's never can I help you but it's yeah. always can you help me and um, I do try but what I think I realized after a year or two of doing that is that I would never achieve anything in my life if I was doing that all the time mm. um, and that's not to say that I haven't met some really genuine people who desperately needed um, help and in more recently in the domestic violence space I think that that overwhelmed me in a way that really made me want to make more time mm. you know it wasn't a case of me running away from all of that I genuinely wouldn't rest until I'd responded to every one of them um, which mm. I did by the way um, so I think I think that people will reach out to you and while I take it tremendously seriously it may just be that they woke up that morning and said I'll just send that to her and they may have sent it to 50 other people often when I get a request I'll go into that person's profile and realize that I'm only one of 50 people that they've written to mm. um, so you see that unbanded will say relentless I, I creative entrepreneur whatever way energy that you evidently have if it only ha it has a certain amount and there's only a certain amount of hours in the day and it's the mm. same energy that can go into family friends your own businesses your own interests and then obviously it's just interesting if you're getting inundated with this sort of stuff being able to kind of manage it and kind of go right and that's why i think the so i suppose doing things like the academy which i do two or three times a year at least allows me to say to people come along and mm -hmm. as much as I ask people to pay to go to that because we pay for the hall and we pay for the AV and we pay for everything in the room I also make sure that there's an amount which is available for people who can't afford to pay okay so um, when just going back to the one thing you said about could anybody start a business and I started to say to you providing they have those traits of entrepreneurship yes. the interesting thing about that is that by the time you're about 21 22 all those traits are laid down except for two mm. so almost all of those traits are in early childhood which is why if you have an A plus student they often don't do well because they haven't yeah. learned the risk-taking and the failure and the resilience and yeah. so I often go into kids and say you know in transition year I do a lot in transition year I'll say you know who's failed an exam or who's not a cool kid who's not following the pack who isn't picked you know that dreadful thing in the sports teams mm. and you're the last one left <laughs> nobody's picked you, you know? yeah you're never chosen for the school play and I always say you're going to be the entrepreneurs of the future mm. like like the rest of you guys who all follow the pack and wear the same clothes and want to do the same thing you'll be the employees and that's okay because yeah. the world needs employees but those of you who are brave enough not to follow the pack and um, I used to always think that in Dell used to be oh you know you'd be a, there was all these command you know command skills assertiveness mm. and all that um, in later years then when I was interviewing people I actually looked for people who were kind of more nervous or more uh, as long as it wasn't debilitating mm -hmm. but that n nervousness means that already they have to get over themselves mm -hmm. in the conversation and that that's a power mm -hmm. in itself and yeah. then, then the nervousness also is linked to I really want to do well I don't want to screw up and that trait I don't know if that is in those sure, traits yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it must be though that, that yeah. wanting to please or want not even please the wrong woman but wanting to do well you know. it's a, it's, so the interest the two that you learn later in life one is adaptability which you can only learn through failure like okay. you just have to nature's harshest but best teacher like if I had always everything done right I'd never have learned anything mm. but interestingly in my early part of my business life nobody admitted to failing now we're all shoving each other out of the way trying to say that we failed more than the other person so yeah. um, so <laughs> failure as if it's a road to yeah, success yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not necessarily, a road, no, it's not necessarily a road to success uh, but it is <laughs> but it is true that sometimes you know failing an exam and having to dust yourself down and go back into the ring you learn far more from that yeah it's than, strength yeah it's like perhaps, a muscle it's a 
must have. I yeah, think, yeah, doing a mediocre job. Mm. And then th the other one that you can learn is is confidence. So I think going back to your point about people who are probably a little bit more introverted. I was not the person to put a hand up at school. I was not mm. chosen for the school play. I was certainly not chosen for any sports teams. So. So confidence was something that took me um, the whole of my 20s to learn. Yeah. And, and thankfully, nature's fix for confidence is plasticity, that little muscle in your brain, which is very hard to use for the first time, um, but much easier once you've used it once. I, I had a taxi driver about six months ago, and knowing who I was, he said, you know, I don't know how you do that public speaking. And I had to speak at my daughter's wedding, and I was so nervous. And, you know, all the family were all around me and I had 15 pints and four whiskeys and I got up and stumbled my way through it and it was an ordeal, I'll never forget it. And I was just paying him at the end and he said, you know, funny thing, it was my son's wedding there a month ago and I made the speech and it was grand. And I was like, that's plasticity. Like the first yeah. time he was horrified and it was dreadful. So the same is true for me, like the first time I had to speak in public and even though during my 20s I was doing radio and TV and I'd, you know, obviously did, after nursing I did print journalism, but I so also... So you think you were shy and a bit nervous about that? Oh, I was, yeah, I wasn't a confident person, no. Do you think it's very interesting that you, being that way, it, it is kind of linked to what you're talking about Africa and stuff like that, but you know, the things, almost, you're going to the opposite, you're putting yourself, you're, you're feeling afraid, really it's the last thing you should be doing, yeah. except it's the thing you seem to be, magnetic. you know, you're drawn to this, I, but but I, I always no? say to you that for, uh, so I was a nurse, you know, yeah. and I went at the age of 17, I left Ireland and trained to be a nurse. And um, and although nursing's great at communication skills, as in, you know, it's the best grounding for life you could possibly, like I, I dealt with issues that most people through the whole of their lifetime wouldn't deal with. Mm. Um, I think that, um, it, you know, for me, it was probably the formative years with my first husband, which I have spoken about, which created the person I am now, which is a very hard thing to say because actually who would want to go through those kind of things in order to develop the kind yeah. of skills that I've relied on for the rest of my life. But, but in my 20s when I was dealing with a very difficult personal life and, and a, a husband who um, was abusive, it was actually you know, of course I had no confidence. I didn't have good friends. I was away from my family. I was pretty vulnerable. I would never have stood up to him, you know. And mm. and because by the time I was 30, I had taken the biggest risk of my life. In other words, walking away from my comfortable house and my lovely life and my husband who um, had done those things to me. Like when I drove away that morning after six or seven attempts at trying to leave, it was like literally driving off a cliff. I remember phoning my sister and I had the most nervous butterflies in my stomach and I felt, you know, like I was free falling because I'd just driven away from everything with just a small bag. I was homeless, like, you know, mm. and and yet I think that all of that taught me something really important in terms of the next steps in my life, you know. I guess it's sorry. It's a terrible, kind of it's very hard thing to explain because no, no, no. I, I guess it's a, a thousand percent. It is almost you have to in that scenario there. You and your everything that you are, you have to. You're saying goodbye to, and you're jumping out completely mm. into the unknown. And you know the expression "better the devil you know." That's why people stay because it's, they're terrified, and it's the same thing. It's you know the very thing you crave is the and that you need to do is the very thing you're terrified, exactly. which is the unknown. Yeah. I slept at an ibis at Heathrow that night. Nobody in my work, um, the only person who knew what my uh, life was like, and she had only known for one week, was my mother. Mm. And I had told her in a way because I knew I would have to leave him after many times of trying to leave him. I knew once I told my mother the true horror of what was going on, mm. that I couldn't face her again if I hadn't left him. So. And then the second person I told was my sister as I was driving away from the house. So it wasn't as if I was going into the booze of arms and I was in London of, you know, fantastic network of friends that I could say, could you all look after me? Mm. I went into work without anybody in work knowing that I had just done that. Mm. And then I looked up the cheapest place in London. It was the Ibis at Heathrow and it was the weirdest sensation to not to go home, yeah. which you want to do at 5.30 and to drive to Heathrow and to, to get into this hotel room where there were families, uh, I could hear babies crying and people excited going on holiday or in transit going to somewhere else. And I was there 
not knowing where my future was, where I was going to live, what was going to happen to me. Um, it was just the strangest feeling. And I, you know, of course, I slept on sofas and um, did all those things for, for months on end before I managed to get somewhere to get mm. settled. Um, but because I did it, and it was the single biggest thing I'd ever done in my life in terms of taking a risk, I don't think anybody, anything after that ever compared to it, you know? Mm -hmm. I was then quite driven to never put myself in a situation again where I was financially reliant on someone else, mm -hmm. to never allow anybody to do what happened to me during those nine years, you know? So I can, it kind of created this energy in me and drive and determination Strength. and resilience. Yeah. And I, I've often said to people, if I'm in a room and I see, which I've unfortunately witnessed many times, people bullying other people in the room or belittling them. And I had a, a man I worked with once whose favorite pastime was to see how many people he could make cry or belittle. And, you know, I would often call them out. I'd know, like I've got into so much trouble and lost so many clients by being the person who sits at the lunch table to say, I'm not listening to this anymore and getting up and walking out. Mm. And I know that people on the outside who don't know me very well would say that's kind of a dragon skill. But it's not. It's no. a survivor. It's a survivor, yeah, yeah. I've been that person and I'd never, I'll not stand by and watch somebody do that to somebody else, you know? It's almost, like, and I say this in, as a man, you can't, but, uh, but uh, you know childbirth, right? So, uh, we, Are we really uh, good? Yeah, we're gonna go, we're, we're, I'm going to try and go there. Um, wow, you but, <laughs> brave man. <laughs> say the idea that this absolute pain <laughs> creates something brand new, births something brand new. And sometimes oh. I think about it, in the, right, bear with in terms of the creative process, and I know there's no comparison, but this kind of shedding an old life and yeah. then into a new life, it's, it, it's pain. I know yeah. a, it's disastrous comparison, but the idea of pain and the new life is created somehow out of pain, out of the ashes of, we'll say, your old life, a new life, and then you come out of that, you're a stronger, more forceful, new direction, it's yes. just very interesting that that one begats the other, isn't it? And it's... Begats even, for fuck's sake, sorry. <laughs> I, look, it's not a bad analogy because I think, um, for one thing, I hardly recognise me when I think about that period mm. of my life. And I did try to bury it so deep that I actually had convinced myself it was somebody else in another life somewhere far away from me. And the only person who ever convinced me that that, that nearly a decade of my life was was part of me was was Richard so I guess you know Richard was always saying to me stop trying to pretend it didn't exist or it didn't happen and stop airbrushing it because the person you are now is made from those mm. years exactly what you say is that we're all products of everything that happens to us that was it was quite a big thing that happened to me during the years when you're supposed to be having fun yeah. maybe dancing you know yeah. <laughs> it's kind of capturing a little bit more of it um, but but I do think um, the pain of going back there, I was really surprised in the last year how difficult it was for me to do it. And I was really surprised I'd even wanted to do it because mm. I had that was totally, if there was, you know, you know, that analogy of digging a hole in the garden and putting things in a box and another box and another box and another box, that's yeah, where that was. The dark place. That was yeah. in about 50 boxes yeah, yeah. buried in the deepest hole. And, I, and, and in my life, because I moved from London back here in 2002, mm. So in a way, I'd created a whole new circle of friends. Nobody knew I was even married the first time. Nobody. Yeah, wow. Well. Like even amongst my personal friends who considered themselves to be quite close to me, when I was facing the difficulty of talking about it, I had to then go back to them and say, can I just discuss something with you before I talk on national television about it? Now they, they had an inkling that I, I, at some point I might have said that there was a guy, you know, that I'd been married to. but. They didn't really know, I never spoke about it, they didn't really know very mm. much about it. So my whole life here was, it started when I met Richard and had Dara and you know, they knew everything from that narrative onwards. My family in particular having to go back and you know, talk about that with my brothers who I hadn't spoken to about it. They mm. also knew something was not yeah. quite right there but I had taken a decision that because he was part of my family for nine years that I wasn't going to you know, spend my time telling them chapter and verse because brothers have a tendency to want to go out and murder people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is 
kind of nice, nice to yeah. that feeling. But I'd rather have them out of prison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, uh, and you're, uh, I think I heard something about your um, your mother's a bit of a legend. Is she's uh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 She's a, she's like an amazing. Um, like all my friends call her their mother. You know, she's. Um, right. She's just one of these people who not only had six of us, you know, we grew up in the Phoenix Park in a lodge and um, my father, and my grandfather were rangers and mm. my mother was a nurse, a psychiatric nurse. And so when she sort of okay. started to raise us, she went back and did nursing again and she worked in the Cara Cheshire home in the Phoenix Park. But um, as soon as she was kind of approaching retirement, she started studying philosophy and learning mm, Irish again. Okay. Then she'd learn French and then she got her certificate in counselling. Then she started working at Child's Line and at 70, she was the oldest person in Ireland to do her computer skills. Okay. <laughs> so she's sitting there. There is genes. Like, she's I mean, there is, you oh, can't, you she have is to unbelievable. Be. Like she's her iPad. She can't live without her yeah. iPad. And, you know, I have friends who are going, I don't get that whole Twitter thing. You know, my, my mum was on every social media platform. <laughs> she and, really? Yeah. Wow. And the, the, even, you know, in the last few years, is I've taken her off to um, we were over in Burma and Hong Kong and Cambodia and you know if I said to her now do you fancy a trip to London she'd have her bag at the door ready you know <laughs> so yeah. well, so obviously I know the expression about the apple and all that but the genes are I mean the, a part of that is genes or whatever you want yeah. to call it personality in she's, the, you know my mom that adaptability and resilience and whatever you want to call it she lost my dad my dad died at 69 and okay. you know died in his sleep and I think I have to say that obviously it is an issue for Irish women because because men tend to die younger and mm. she is uh, there's a, a sort of a matriarch warrior type person and my mother isn't an overtly you know, she she's also quite somebody who's you know she's not brimming with confidence she's very nice and she's mm. full of life and she's full of um, the ability to enjoy life but she has that inner strength and I guess I saw her when Harry my dad died that she um, she wanted to be independent she didn't mm. want us because we were all phoning her 50 times a day and we missed my dad and but we were also worried about her and you know um, she very much told us I am doing my own thing you know and she was studying all the time and she developed her own friends network and she you know she sort of showed me in a way you know she showed me how you could behave after that you know mm. yeah yeah okay yeah 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 yeah, I think there is though a natural, um, just when you describe the multiplicity of things that she's getting up to and then changing and wanting, it's this, Yeah. I think it's, is it, I don't know if it's striving, but this just wanting to kind she's of learn of and yeah. you keep going. Yeah. And I, she wrote a chapter in my book, uh, Spark, and um, I remember when we were doing the tours and we were talking and we did a big event and everything. and. You know, people would say, "Well, I love you, Nora," but actually, your mother, like she's amazing. <laughs> so, as much as they were there for me, <laughs> there would be a cue for my mother to sign the book because she'd written this brilliant yeah. chapter in it. You know, um, I, I, just with time and everything like that, ha, I, we spoke downstairs briefly just about Planet Woman, mm. um, and um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that idea of. Um, uh, you talked about the four or the, the two traits we talked a little bit about those yeah. traits but what about this, this planet woman and are, are you taking it out there or is it going to go further is this going to be an, an, a project that's going to I, I think um, the four differences between women and men yeah. are, are you were saying they're scientifically they're scientifically yeah 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 so um, it's up to you about time because they take a bit of time to explain yeah um, well you, you, I'm free so the only thing I might have to do is change a camera. We, we've done an hour and five minutes. So yeah. I might kind of keep, we might just say, right, that's our hour and five minutes. And if you want, then I can give you a separate thing with, you know, these, it's up to you and your time. Yeah, now, I, think, I, think cool. we, I think if you, if you have the ability to chop this, I, yeah. I don't but, think anyone's going to listen to an hour and a half. So, um, no, so what and I the next bit is a really only, it probably is 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so it would be nice to do a shorter one, maybe. Yeah, fine. So, do you want then? Do you want to finish this, and we'll? Yeah, and uh, well, so what we uh, this is, we'll say this is it finished, as, as casual as this, yeah. right? Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm even going to leave in the bit about this, right? So then, are you yeah. going to leave in the childbirth? I hope you do. That was, that was the best analogy <laughs> I could I've ever heard. I feel myself dying a little ever. bit. This cringe, going, oh please, don't follow through with this. You know, sometimes you just have to kind of stop. Fuck. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
Thank you. And thank you for taking the leap to come out here. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Hi, if you like the conversation that I just had and you'd like more, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you. Frank, 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 what a man.